Today, I'm speaking with Nina Paley. And Nina, you describe yourself as a canceled artist. So I'm hoping to hear more about that origin story. And you're the co-host of the Hetero Dorks podcast with Corinna Cohn. And that's where I've heard most, well, I guess that's where I'm most acquainted with your uh, your work, your your thoughts on things. I really appreciate how open you are. I find the two of you very relatable and just it's it's really it's like listening to friends have a conversation listening to you guys and it's it's really enjoyable but we haven't really talked that much we, we've only spoken once before and it was for the solid ground live stream we did this last monday and again i appreciated that you sort of just you were open to just exploring and and going into some topics that were we sort of just randomly started talking about things but they were really it, you know, it, I just, I appreciate the, the willingness to have big conversations that, that you've displayed, but I don't know that much about your background. So I'm really interested in, do you mind sort of introducing your background and who you are a little bit and talking about being a canceled artist and what that means? Sure. Yeah. I used to be, you know, more famous for my art than I was for being a horrible bigoted turf uh, my, my work used to be taught in universities and I used to go to film festivals all over the world. And, uh, that's what I mean by canceled artist. Now I meet people who are like, yeah, what kind of art do you do? <laughs> really? You're an artist, <laughs> not just a podcaster. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm an animator. And prior to that, I was a cartoonist, like a newspaper cartoonist. And I made a couple of films. The first feature film I made is called Sita Sings the Blues. The second one is called Seder Masochism. A few years ago, I animated The Apocalypse, but it's not a film. It's a website with about 300 animated GIFs. Last year, I made a comic book. I finally just, just threw up my hands and went, all right, I'm not going to make some timeless thing about mythology and theology i'm going to make something about the current situation uh so it's called agents of hag and it's a turfy comic book it's a gender critical comic book that got canceled by indiegogo uh and i made a stink about it and then i made the gender wars playing cards so the 2023 edition of the Gender Wars playing cards, which is very, very attached to time, unlike much of my work. Mm. Uh, so I, I now have, I'm now like better known for that than for what I consider my more important works, <laughs> simply because my more important works have been buried and canceled, but I'm still proud of those works and maybe I'll do something like that again but it's hard it's hard being a canceled artist it really discourages one from making art you get beaten up so badly and well yeah you have lots of cancel stories right like cancellation is a uh it's a very traumatic thing to go through and I'm only finding new ways to cope with it. It's only been a few months ago that I reached a turning point in my mm -hmm. being canceled experience, but it, I've been canceled since it started in 2017 and then really blew up in 2018. And it just keeps going on and on. Oh, it must be a strange experience to go from being identifying professionally with your art to having this whole new sort of public life where it's about your thoughts on certain things or your intellectual processes. And it sounds like it's a completely different chapter. Well, my art is also about my thoughts on certain things and my intellectual okay. processes. So in uh -huh. that way, it's similar. The The different thing which is not really that different. It's it's the scapegoat experience. So, mm. you know, the higher mm. they fly, the harder they fall. Mm. And uh, 10, 12 years ago, 12 years ago, no more, it's 2024. So 16 years ago, 16 years ago, I had 
swarms of people coming out of the blue saying I was their hero. My work was amazing. They admire me so much. Oh my God, this is incredible. Spilling out like personal things to me in emails. And some of those same people are the ones that absolutely trashed me in 2017 Hmm. and 2018. And honestly, it was very hard to cope with the first wave. It was in some ways harder to cope with being popular for the first time in my life. Uh, Because something felt very unstable about that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But it's like, you should accept the love, the love. It's not actually love. Fandom is not the same as love. Or maybe it's a kind of love, but it's... Uh, it's not stable, as mm-hmm. many people have noted in this world, including the Buddha. Uh, but yeah, I had that, like, you know, I had the up and then I had the the down. And mm-hmm. that is life. Yeah. The experience of being put on a pedestal and then knocked off. Yes. Yes. Mm. How did you get canceled? What was the, what were the events or statements or what led up to you losing or being knocked off that pedestal and being demonized by those same people that had been idealizing you before? Yeah. Um, I spent a little over a year pondering what was going on with gender. So Mm -hmm. I wasn't canceled yet, but I I used Facebook a lot back Mm -hmm. then. And I had shared two articles. One was this article by Eleanor Burkett Mm -hmm. about Caitlyn Jenner. It was feminist and gender critical. And people were saying I was transphobic after that, which was odd to me because Mm -hmm. I had had some trans lovers and lots of trans friends and had had gender dysphoria myself and had zero animosity towards trans people. So, and the people that were saying this were not people that were in that community. They were not people from the, you know, queer worlds. These were normies now saying Mm -hmm. that. So I was like, what is going on? The other article I shared was about Rachel Dolezal because her scandal happened around the same time. And of course I asked that deeply transphobic question how is transracial different than transgender? Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is not acceptable. And people were saying that I was a right-wing Trump voting person who hates trans people, and they were wrong on all counts. So I just decided to not talk about that in public for a while and do some research. Oh, and they called me a TERF. Mm -hmm. And... uh, I knew I wasn't trans exclusionary and they kept saying, educate yourself. And I had been very, very educated on things trans and sex positive and things like that. So I thought, well, what can I educate myself on? Well, radical feminism. I don't really know much about radical feminism. They're saying I'm one. So what does that mean? So that began my year of research, discovering Mm -hmm. the gender critical Reddit, uh, reading uh, The Man Who Would Be Queen Mm -hmm. by Michael Bailey, reading Andrea Dworkin for the first time, uh, because I did not read her when I was younger, because other people said that she had said that all heterosexual sex is rape. Mm. And I thought, well, that just sounds unhinged. So I'm not going to read her because, <laughs> because who needs that? But this time I did read her because she's a radical feminist. And, and I actually read that particular book intercourse. Mm. And I thought this is very sensitively written. She is not saying that all heterosexual sex is rape. Mm. And yet I believed the people that said that, and I just went ahead and denounced her anyway. Um, so after a little over a year of pondering this, <clears throat> one day I saw some meme circulating amongst my friends. It was one of those George Takai shared memes. It mm-hmm. was comparing uh, women who don't want men in their bathrooms to racists using the metaphor of drinking fountains, of whites-only mm. drinking fountains. And 
I unheld my tongue hmm. and I said, this is misogynistic, basically. And thousands of people came to denounce me as a turf on Facebook. That was the start. Hmm. It continued a few months later when there was this, <clears throat> I guess it was a Women's Day march in Canada. Sorry, there's like crud in my throat. <clears> throat> <laughs> and a woman had held a sign that said biology is not hate and this canadian politician named morgan ogre was hunting her he had put the word out like find this woman you know find her and bring me her head <laughs> basically people were hunting for her and i thought this is crazy and wrong and I admire women who have been speaking out about this. And I'm going to be one of those women, right? Like I'm, you know, Megan Murphy's brave. I'm going to be brave now. And I can be brave. Like I'm not employed. I don't have a normal job. So I'm going to speak out. And I did. And uh, I got kicked off Facebook for the first time. My film's got canceled from film festivals. My presence from film festivals was canceled for no reason, right? It was just coincidental. Mm. Uh, and, and then what happened? It got, oh yes, the local screening got canceled. And then I shared, so I have this irreverent sense of humor. And a woman I knew on Facebook Connie Bryson had written amusing song lyrics that went, if a person has a penis, he's a man. She called it the transgender song. And I shared it. And people were furious. In fact, that song is attributed to me because my sharing of it got more traction of it than Connie's did. Uh, but I didn't write it. I shared it. And I got denounced by tons of people, uh, classified as a danger to trans people. And yeah, it just went from there. And that's that's really the the evidence that people started pointing to of what a transphobe I was when they were canceling my film. Hmm. It's like, look, she posted this on Facebook. So she wants to kill trans people. It's that it's that sort of caricaturizing of one's thoughts putting your your statements or your thoughts in this extreme bucket based on just sort of a mild like you said about this andrea dworkin book i haven't read this book maybe i should but it sounds like that was that same experience that you were witnessing there where her thoughts were being categorized as extreme and uh, there's got to be a nice way to say this when you, or a nice, a nice phrase for this, when you kind of reduce someone's thoughts down to a caricature of what they really are. Straw manning. Straw manning. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. It's got to be, there's, yeah, it's probably a number of rhetorical fallacies that, yeah. that that would be. Um, but it's that same process. You, you were seeing it when you said the, the people who were initially calling you a turf, and you're saying, I'm not, I'm not trans exclusionary. These are thoughts that are encompass my experiences and I accept trans people in my life. And yet I have some degree of nuance to my thinking and they're not allowing for that nuance. That same kind of distorted thinking is it seems to be present in so many areas right now. Um, and this, when you're describing how the initial response to your, your Facebook posts was kind of like, you're a, you're a transphobe, even though you are not a transphobe. It's this, this wanting to lump you into the very worst, just for saying something that deviates from the party line, whatever that is, this rigidity of thinking around these issues. Well, I'm not sure it's because I said those things. I think it's because people need scapegoats. And so when you do not uphold the party line, that gives them permission to scapegoat you in their tribe. Like if you're a good person, you're going to uphold this stuff and say the catechism, whether you believe it or not. 
And if you're not doing that, then you're not, you're clearly not adhering to the tribe. You're clearly not putting the, the hive or whatever the group is above yourself. Mm -hmm. And people love attacking people. That's, that's something that's been made <laughs> abundantly clear. Uh, and that, that's been the hardest part of it that people form mobs so easily and will go after anyone, like no matter what their bonds are with them, this, this stuff rips apart families mm -hmm. and old friendships and organizations. It just rips through everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, people are capable of that and that's how they behave. It's a very painful thing to accept. It must have been horrible having being mobbed like that online and then watching your work canceled because of it. Yeah, it's horrible. And it, mm. it, it still continues. So it's actually going on in my family right now. Oh, no. My family is now being ripped apart. And uh, so I'm I'm hearing mischaracterizations of myself secondhand no. to family members and uh it's very, it's sad and puzzling. And I know I need to forgive everyone. So that's been the main change. Like when this stuff was happening, I was just like, I am never forgiving any of these people. I am getting revenge. I am saving receipts. I have a record of all these things people are, have said online. And when they pretend they never said this in a few years, I am going to pull them out and embarrass them. I do. I do have all these files, but there's like more files than I could possibly keep track of. And I'm tired. And also it's not that healthy. And I'm finally at a point where I'm just like, let them go, let it go. They know not what they do. They really don't. Because when people get into the this mentality, they are not thinking for themselves. And that is that is the common state of humans to not think for themselves. It's not even unusual. So there's just some pathology moving through humanity as happens from time to time. This certainly isn't the first. And uh, this is my species. There's not another one that I belong to. So uh, I have to make my peace with it. And if you're curious, uh, so I've been obsessed with scapegoat stories for several years, and I've wanted to make a movie about scapegoats or find, because I, I like to make projects about, about religion or mythologies that address the human condition, my condition. And I thought, what's the most famous story we have about scapegoats? And I thought the story of Jesus Christ, right? He was nailed to a cross. He was a scapegoat. So I've been interviewing people uh, to tell me the story of Jesus. And like, why was he nailed to a cross? Why did all these people like hate him if he was just fine? But it has become clear in these interviews that people do not think of Jesus as a scapegoat. They think of mm -hmm. him as as a twin archetype, if you know about the story of the scapegoat, the scapegoat ritual. So mm -hmm. the priest or whatever, the tribe selects two goats, not just one. And the priest draws lots by random. And one of the goats is assigned scapegoat and the other goat is assigned sacrificial goat. The sacrificial goat is slaughtered and put on an altar and offered to God. The scapegoat is tagged for Azazel and ejected from the tribe and thrown off a cliff or just left to die in the wilderness. And Jesus was a sacrificial goat or lamb, sacrificial lamb. And a few months ago, I thought maybe I'm a sacrificial lamb and not a scapegoat. It feels a lot better. It's mm -hmm. like, this is between me and God. All these human beings, they don't know me. They don't know anything about me. They're humans just doing their human thing. And the consequence of this is that I lose things that are most dear to me. I lose my reputation. I lose uh, the prominence of my work, which is so important to me that people just see it. 
you know, lose my good name, lose my friends, lose my status, very precious things to me. Uh, but this is not the, this is not the decision really of all of these people. They're motivated. I don't know. I don't really even know what's going on with them, hmm. but if I, think of it as like a sacrifice to God. <laughs> not that I even, I'm not part of an organized religion. I, a big part of me is still grounded in atheism, but it's the other part of me that's talking. Uh, yeah. If I just think, oh, this is between me and God, then it's possible to forgive all these people. Mm. Then it really is like, they know not what they do. And it's, it, they're not in control of themselves. And whatever the story is, you know, my part in it is to let go of these things that are precious to me. It's a sacrifice. I don't really have a choice, but I, I mean, my choice is to be a scapegoat and to be miserable or to be a sacrifice and have a relationship with God. Sorry, fellow atheists. I know that sounds real weird. It's just one half of my brain talking. Okay. The other half is like, yeah, yeah, there's no man in the sky or anything, but I need, I need that half too. Well, it's um, it's. I'm glad you're talking about this. I'm I'm glad to be able to talk with you about this because I think there's, I think so often, people focus only on the substance of their issue, and they don't think at all about the form of their behavior, and they're both important. I mean, there's the the substance of whatever race race relations racism. And then there's the way that you go about trying to address that. And then there's the substance of um, gender and whatever that means. And then there's the way that you go about addressing it. And what you're talking about is the way that people are going about these things. It's this mobbing and this black and white thinking and the excommunication of heretics. And, you know, this this is the process that that seems to me to be the real toxic element in the way that people engage around these things. Yes, we're, and we've seen it within just the last couple of months. This has been, there's been all this splintering within the gender critical people that follows that same form. It's that same playbook. And you see it applied here. And I feel like that's the real conversation. And I, and at least it seems to me that that's the real conversation is how we go about addressing our concerns with, with each other, the way that we treat our fellow human beings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, so-called radical feminists are groups of them are canceling people. Now they're forming purity spirals. They're, you know, accusing guilt by association. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's just super off-putting of course i'm the target of some of it they're not they're not as powerful as the larger society but it's it is the same behavior and that's why i'm not down with it when mm -hmm. supposedly my tribe does this honestly the people that canceled me were my tribe i used to just be a full-fledged liberal mm -hmm. and my tribe did this to me and so it's like i found like this small tribe and oh, now they're doing it too. So, uh, no, canceling is not cool. Mm -hmm. Canceling, yeah. And I, I saw that you, I somewhere I saw a picture of you in the famous dress. Yes, you had uh, you have a version of the the Phil Illy dress. Yes, and if it were warmer, I would be wearing it for our <laughs> interview. But it's cold today. But I'm so I looking was wondering. forward to wearing it. I'm going to wear it a lot. I have the arm warmers, and now I have the exact same model of dress. The whole outfit. The whole outfit. Well, I don't have the same blue sneakers, but I have blue hiking boots. They'll have to do. Do you have the glasses too? The no. fun glasses. No, I don't have Phil Illy glasses. But yeah, and you know the fact that I'm that I'm willing to dress like a man because Phil Illy is a man. So mm -hmm. when I wear that dress, I am cross-dressing. Ah. <laughs> Wearing men's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the reason that I do that is not because Phil Illy is like a paragon of anything. I mean, his book is dubious. Uh, his practice is not my favorite thing. I mean, I would not encourage 
men to wear dresses, but at conferences, but you know, he's free to do that. And his demonization is absolutely uncalled for. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, and, and I, I wear it mockingly. It's like, yes, I wear this dress. Well, I will wear it when it's warm enough uh, to mock people that demonize this. People don't it's like been to be mocked. Incredible. The response to that, to the, the Phil Illy, the AGP gate, as some people call it after the Genspect conference. And I've spoken with Phil, I guess I've had him on once I had him on with Shannon Thrace and we yeah. had a great conversation and I feel the same way. There's, there's, you know, elements of his content that I would, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in doing like hard hitting interviews with people where I challenge them on things. That's just not anything I'm interested in. But if I were to, I probably would find things that I would, I would bring up and ask about more deeply or challenge, but I'm just not interested in that. Um, I am interested in where people are coming from and the content of their story and their perspective. And I just thought that the, the demonization of him based on, he was almost like an effigy for people's frustration. It's that same scapegoating. And it, it was, it's pretty incredible. I, I had so many negative comments and they still come in on that interview and on other ones based on me being willing to talk with him and just willing to see him as a human being. And it's, it's pretty crazy. It, it's, it, uh, you said a little while ago about that you have an irreverent sense of humor and humor sen seems to be the thing that's missing in a lot of these purity spirals. There's just no sense of nuance or humor. It's not allowed. You have to have the same exact black and white line of thinking, or you are, cast aside purity spiral yeah people are afraid i guess people don't find a lot of humor when they're afraid although i find humor when i'm afraid and when i'm angry mm -hmm. uh when i'm sad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what is your what is your current take on the conversation around there are hardliners who say never use someone's pronouns if they have if they have special pronoun requests or if they are a trans person i i i don't know how corinna likes to be referred to it sounds like people kind of use he or she interchangeably for corinna and i don't know i don't know what corinna's preference is i hear you call corinna he do you have a hardline take on that that's one of the purity spirals that i'm seeing on twitter right now yeah many years ago I decided I was going to use sex-based pronouns. That is mm -hmm. my policy. So I use sex-based pronouns for everyone. I slip up when I am talking to various trans men who pass. So mm -hmm. women who, when I have time to think, I will call them she, but when I'm talking to them, their facial hair and their bald spots and all that will throw me for a loop. So I get the cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. but my policy is to call them she, even though, you know, it messes mm -hmm. with my head. That is out of no animosity towards them whatsoever. It is not a sign of disrespect. I don't mm -hmm. think pronouns should have anything to do with respect or disrespect. That is my way of speaking, that is the language I speak. And I believe that pronouns are in the mouths of the speaker and that individuals have no right whatsoever to dictate how other people speak about them. Mm -hmm. That is Corinna's take also, but it doesn't matter. The whole point when people say like, oh, is Corinna okay with that? I am just like, you are missing the point. The point mm -hmm. is that you get to speak the way you want to speak. And I get to speak the way I want to speak. And uh, nobody else gets to dictate the way that I speak, including the person I am speaking about. Mm -hmm. So even though I have my sex-based pronouns policy, 
I do not like it when other people are try to dictate to other people that they should have the same policy. Of course, mm-hmm. I like that policy. I think there are excellent arguments in favor for that policy, but um, I denounce you if you don't is not a good policy. Mm-hmm. And you know we're gonna we're gonna mob you and condemn you in public and try to cancel you if you don't is not a good policy. Those are not. <laughs> good arguments. Uh, yeah. So it's like, don't tell other people how to talk. Mm. I talk this way because I think for myself how to talk and other people have other reasons for talking the way that they do. I may not like them and I may criticize them. I do not like how some of these, uh, <laughs> some call them ultras, some call them femagogues, but how they respond when people are criticizing them or complaining about their mobbing behavior. You complain about the mobbing behavior and they say, well, I'm criticizing. It's We need to criticize this language. And I say, you can criticize this language without denouncing and demonizing people and ostracizing them. Mm-hmm. Criticize the language, like say what you mean, but don't say it mean or don't say it any meaner than you have to mm-hmm. stick to the facts. But people are so excited when they have an opportunity to eject someone from their group. It's very mm-hmm. primal. Mm-hmm. It does come back down to that, that same process again. Yeah. The the pronoun thing is really interesting. It feels like it's such a, it's a relatively new convention that we play with this on, in the mainstream anyway. Uh, this mainstreaming of using pronouns as a euphemism for how we're supposed to see somebody. And when you talk about uh, certain trans men, so natal females who have undergone gender modification, um, I I know exactly what you mean. There's this real, there, there, there's such a uh, strong masculine presentation that it is, it's jarring to me I still don't know how to handle the, how I want to handle all of the way I address people or talk about them. Uh, It's an ongoing evolving process for me to figure this out. Sometimes if someone really looks like the, I guess the transitioned sex, if they really resemble that, or if they're very androgynous, you know, using their natal pronouns, their their biological pronouns doesn't quite feel right. Like that doesn't feel right to me, but using the uh, preferred way of addressing them also doesn't really feel right. So I'm hovering somewhere in the middle and kind of making up. I'm, I don't have that policy yet. I don't have a policy on that. The only policy I have had on that is I don't think that we should be encouraging this general uh, putting pronouns in your in your bio or in your signature all the time, announcing your pronouns on your name tag and pretending like we can't ever recognize someone's sex. Like we can't know until someone tells you what to call them. I feel like that creates this real language confusion. And I think it's incredibly unhealthy. Yeah, I agree. It's a signal. Mm -hmm. It's a signal that you're willing to say the catechism, but -hmm. it's very disappointing that so-called gender critical side is also now using it as a symbol of Mm -hmm. tribal allegiance. Yeah. That's been really disappointing to me as well. And it's been surprising. It was, I, I I think I, I wasn't expecting it. It kind of came out of nowhere the past several months, but I also haven't spent a lot of time online in my life. I, I, you know, I mean, I have, but I, I haven't been very online, I guess, as as they say, I, I went years, I raised my daughters without a TV in the house and I had a laptop for school, but I didn't have a computer that I just sat at. It wasn't part of my repertoire to be in forums and to spend a lot of time on Facebook and stuff. So this process, of, I wonder how much of this is just a part of the internet age, these kind of mobs and stuff. They seem like they are a product of the anonymity that people feel that there's more viciousness and there's more ability to mob and to, and to kind of go into that black and white thinking when we're communicating electronically. I think it speeds it up hugely, Mm -hmm. but I also think this is human nature. You, you only have to look at history to Mm -hmm. have that confirmed. 
-hmm. But this is like, it's like, I think these huge pathologies have moved in waves through human populations and now they just do it faster. When you were talking about your research project or your, your creative project around Jesus Christ, and you were talking about the two sides of your thinking on this, do you feel like you've had, uh, it sounds like you've had some sort of a spiritual process with coming to terms with this. What's that, what's that been like for you? Ah, well, what has it been like for me? I mean, uh, I've cultivated a spiritual process since I was 18 or 19 years old because I have various compulsive behaviors that are addressed through spiritual processes. <laughs> And I have wanted to recover. And so despite being raised atheist and having a very strong intellect that resists this, I have wanted to recover. So mm -hmm. I just have done this at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of things in life are... are well addressed <laughs> through a spiritual process. Uh, what's it been like? I mean, it's, it's hard being insulted and ostracized. It's being kicked out of your tribe is just about the most stressful thing that a human can go through. It's one of the most stressful things. There's lots of stressful things, but that's, you know, that's up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's just a lot of grieving that has to do, and there's a lot of disbelief and, uh, yeah, it's a very difficult thing to endure. Some people don't make it. Some people commit suicide. Some people have full on nervous breakdowns and, and get committed, um, so I'm actually pretty robust, like more robust than I thought I might have been. But yeah, there's like a lot of weeping and depression and uh, not being productive and, and the distrust, the distrust of your fellow humans, the distrust of everyone. It's not workable. Right. So it's like I can I can see I could see the effect this was having on me. And I knew I didn't want to be this way. I just I can't be in the world with no trust at all. Uh so what? I've been patient with myself, I guess. I've I used to suffer from horrific depressions when I was young. And I've I've had experiences being a scapegoat from a very young age. So my family scapegoated me. I was the mm. so-called identified patient in my dysfunctional family. Mm -hmm. And I still am today. Uh, and I had a horrific time in school. And in junior high, especially, I was scapegoated. And girls especially are awful at that time. And... Mm -hmm. uh, And one way that I responded to that was with vicious depressions, which I think of these days as a kind of autoimmune illness. Hmm. Like I attacked myself and like, I just, I just think being, being demonized and scapegoated that much from an early age, just kind of made me ill, made me mentally ill. So mm -hmm. I would just attack myself relentlessly. And then I would try to find ways to feel better, such as, you know, dysfunctional romantic relationships, mm -hmm. you know, male attention, uh, other people's attention, positive attention, like, like, for for dear life, I had an external locus of control. Mm -hmm. 
and would pursue relief in the form of other people countering what I was doing inside my own head. Uh, yeah, trying to describe this process. Yeah. But anyway, as I, my biggest challenge as a young adult was recovering from junior high school and learning to trust people and acknowledging that when, you know, I was, had all this social anxiety because every time I met new people, the first thing I would think is that that person hates me and they're finding all these things wrong with me and they're finding all these reasons to attack me. And that was just not useful. So I learned to stop doing that and to trust and go like, you know, these people are probably just thinking about themselves. And if I look them in the eye, that's probably going to be fine. And if it's not fine, it means that they've got something going on that has nothing to do with me. So I got healthier and then I got canceled. And then it was like, people really are thinking terrible things about me that aren't true. <laughs> what do I do about this? Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I do the same thing, which is I don't kill myself, even if I want to. <laughs> and uh, gradually recover over time. And you have been recently going through your old journals from when you were younger, and you had some nice things to say about that when I, when we were talking last time we spoke, um, I, I think my first response was I would cringe so hard to read this, the words of younger me. I would just, it would, I, I'm not sure I'd want to see how silly or deluded or, you know, what my thinking was like when I was younger. And you said that you actually found a lot of compassion for your younger self through reading these. Yeah, I'm surprised. I'm I'm kind of in love with myself right now. Oh. <laughs> That's so sweet. It is it is sweet because this 18-year-old didn't really know who she was writing for. And it's oh. like, "Oh, it's me. I understand you, 18-year-old self. I'm the only person in the world who does." That's so sweet. That sounds like a a a part of that self-compassion piece that recognizing your own value even if you're getting negative feedback from outside. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's a miraculous process that mm -hmm. I've stumbled upon. Uh, yeah. I thought I was just going to be cringe, cringe, cringing. I mean, it is cringy because this, uh, this character, this 18 year old self that I am so fond of, I know what she's about to do. She's about to do some terrible things <laughs> oh. and there's like no stopping her. So yeah, there'll be cringing. It's like, Oh, Oh no. Oh my gosh. But at the same time, you know, I know how it turns out. Like she is worried about her future. She has the weight of time. Like she doesn't know how she's going to live for the next. I mean, sometimes it's just for the next few hours. Right. Cause she's so miserable but she doesn't know how she's going to live for the next year or 10 years. And it's been 37 years since she lived. Mm -hmm. So it's great. It's like she survives. What do you, what do you think you'll do with this project or will it, will it become a project or is this just a personal exploration? Well, it might become another half finished thing, but I really do want to write a book. I've been thinking for a while now that I am in my mid fifties, I am old uh, and I have things to say. And occasionally I've thought like I should write a memoir, mm -hmm. which is appropriate in your fifties, <laughs> not appropriate yes. in your twenties yeah. um, because I was an egomaniac, more of an egomaniac, I should say then. And so there are other times in my life I've thought, yeah, I should write a memoir, but I never did because I was like, that's not appropriate. Uh, so yeah, writing to my 18 year old self is writing a memoir kind of in reverse, or it's like a time skipping mm -hmm. memoir because I am telling myself what happens mm -hmm. <laughs> because she was so anxious <laughs> and uh, I have a lot to reassure her with. And she had a lot of ideas about what was happening and she was right about a lot of them, but yeah, 18 year old self well, maybe not 18, it got more intense, 19, 20, 21 year old self, really concerned about the environment. 
And mm. it's like, yeah, you were right to be concerned. Yep, it's getting worse and worse. You were right about all this stuff, but it's happening more slowly than you thought it would. And uh, it's tempered with other things. I felt so deeply when I was 18 that the, I mean, it is something you should feel deeply, right? But I was acutely aware of the mass extinction of other species and it broke my heart. I felt mm -hmm. it. And, um, and that drove me. So when I see 18 year olds today defacing oil paintings and stopping traffic by, mm -hmm. you know, lining up on highways and gluing themselves to things, <laughs> uh, which is met with a lot of contempt from my friends now. So I see 18 year olds defacing paintings and gluing themselves to things and blocking traffic. And uh, when I was younger, I would have admired that. Mm -hmm. And I understand the, the emotions that are driving that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, even though I was a hot mess at 18 and an even hotter mess at 19 and 20, I had more discipline to regulate my emotions than young people do today. That is a horrific notion, mm -hmm. right? Like, hey, 18 year old self, kids today are going to be even sicker than you oh gosh because yeah. i was really sick uh but yeah i there's you know i i felt a crisis i felt profound injustice and extreme measures were necessary because the world grinding on as it was was killing the planet and you know, it still is. So how have I made peace with reality? Like, I have. I have made peace with reality. It is amazing that I have. That's how I stay alive. Because if I had remained in that state, I would have killed myself. <laughs> and I didn't want to. And I'm glad that I didn't. But it did staying alive this long has required uh, a revision of expectations about the world. The world is not just. Uh, humanity is not beautiful. Nature is not beautiful. And my ideas about the way the world should be are necessarily naive and the world worlds this is the world it is bigger than me much bigger infinitely bigger than me and i am not going to be able to fully comprehend it let alone direct it let alone decide what is best for it so i guess i have gained some humility and i guess that is part of becoming a grown-up and staying alive. And I wouldn't trade it. It's like, I admire the the spirit, the fighty, angry spirit of my young self. It's still there, I think, in some ways, obviously, because here I am, a grown-up who's been canceled. So I still have courage. Uh, and it's still the world. And I want to continue to live in it that fighty angry spirit that you describe and in, in yourself and in the the kids that are engaged in all the the activist stuff that you're talking about plus more plus the social justice just all of it it seems like it's a developmental imperative you know for kids to go through this to some degree to have a mission to have a sense of zeal and and some drive that propels them into a hard world to so in order to want to live in the world, in order to want to make something out of their life, but it's so easily turned into, into an activism that tells other people how to change their lives, tells others how to live. So it seems like a very, like it's been so skillfully hijacked. 
yeah and by manipulate it. by groups so i have mm. for a long time thought that i would have transed as a young person mm -hmm. i still think that i don't think i would have transed at 18 reading myself writing as an 18 year old i was adult enough then Mm -hmm. that I wouldn't have fallen for it because by that time I was very sensitive to cults. Mm -hmm. So they, it would have had to happen when I was younger, like 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that adolescence is a lot more delayed now and cults are prevalent now the thing with the internet facilitating the speed of these waves of pathologies moving through human populations. It's also, you know, connection. We all long for connection, these huge connections, but uh, a, a big and even natural aspect of connections is cults form. Human beings are cultish. Everyone that I know that has formed an intentional community out in the country as we all, well, as many of us long to do, it's become a cult really quickly. So you don't mm -hmm. start like, I'm going to start a cult, but it becomes a cult. And Corinna and I joke about our cult, like every time we, <laughs> <laughs> like, let's, you know, this is a nice house. This would be a great turf tranny cult compound. It just <laughs> happens. And humans, I guess, are not prepared for this level of connection with other humans. I'm so sorry to say this because it was so hopeful when it started. What's the difference I'm, between a tribe and a cult? Uh, very little, very little. And sometimes I use the word community and cult interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Like I'll read an article and someone will say community, 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 and I'll just be like, cult, cult, cult. Yeah. Insert cult here. Yeah. And that includes communities that I'm part of, they're, they're different words for frequently the same thing. Mm -hmm. We need, we need communities. And that means that we're vulnerable to cults. It's like people are in cults because they get a lot of warm fuzzies from it and a sense of security and a sense of belonging that is precious. Mm -hmm. And it's a very hard life to not have that. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, you're talking about connection and the internet and, you know, when reality TV started around what, late nineties, maybe started to really be a thing. I thought it was really disturbing. I found it so disturbing. This is about the time I, I, uh, I guess it was early two thousands when I got rid of TV in my life, got just ejected television. And, uh, but, but I, I hated this, these there was something so scripted and curated about the way people were presenting it as reality. And I think the internet is just so full of that and, you know, filters and these staged, uh, they look like they're candid, but they're really staged things that you see constantly clips of. Um, one of the things that I, that I really like about your conversations with Corinna is the, just the openness that you guys have together. It's this real vulnerable, open discussion and it goes where it goes and you speak very candidly. And I think it's really refreshing when so much is curated and specially packaged and filtered for consumption to see people having honest dialogues. And at the same time, it, it leaves you really open. And I, you've mentioned, I, I've heard you say, People don't want to hear so much about my sex life. People say I've talked too much about. So you must be getting some kind of feedback that's negative sometimes. And how do you handle the negative feedback? How do you feel about that? It's like the side effect of being really open. You Maybe a lot of people really appreciate that and connect with it. But then other people hear it and go, ew, at your innermost stuff, like the stuff that you're laying out. So how does that impact you? Well, the podcast... The, the listenership of the podcast fluctuates between about three and 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. So it's not that big. Mm 
uh, and very few of those people leave comments. And I mostly get positive feedback, and that's fine. I am a longtime veteran of feedback and being, to some extent, a public figure. I started drawing an autobiographical comic strip in 1987. So I was putting myself out there. The autobiographical comic strip, by the way, was an extension of these journals I was keeping. So I'm mm. reading the first ones. But what I really wanted to do was somehow turn that into a comic. And I did. Mm. So, yeah, I've been neurotic and vulnerable in public <laughs> since I was 19 or 20. Uh, yeah, and I've had lots of experience getting negative feedback. And it doesn't do much now, but some of it has to just do with the proportion. So with the podcast, Heterodorks, uh, we get so much more positive than negative feedback that the negative stuff is like, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, with other stuff, I get much more negative feedback. Um, I don't know. Sometimes it hurts. You just move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like if you, if you let that stuff... <clears throat> really control what you say, then you're lost. Mm -hmm. And I will say, you know, the reason I love my 18 year old self is she was doing that. Like she was writing it down, but she was just being as honest as she could. And she was looking for the things that, that you can't say, or that other people don't want you to say, because she was trying to save herself. I mean, she was like really depressed. She was in a family where she was the family scapegoat and they were trying to keep her from thinking and saying things. And if she said these things, she would get attacked, but she knew, <laughs> she knew what she saw and experienced. She knew she had to put them somewhere. Well, and I think it's really valuable for people to see a window into that because it validates things that they are probably feeling themselves and or at least many people will be feeling but often not showing yeah uh shoot i had a thought and it's gone oh television right yeah yeah so did you read the book for arguments for the elimination of television no i haven't i haven't read that by jerry mander it's a Jerry classic. Mander, Jerry Mander. <laughs> yes, his his parents had a sense of humor, he says. <laughs> That's his real name. Yeah, J-E-R-R-Y. He was a very successful ad man, actually. Oh. Uh, and he wrote this book maybe as early as the 70s, but certainly by the 80s. Mm. And I got rid of my television, too. Yeah. And uh, I was very glad for that and proud of it. And now I am embarrassed for myself because I'm such an internet addict. It's like, ah, it got me anyway. It just but shifted I did. to a different yeah, form. Yeah, it shifted. Uh, however, I will say I still don't watch that much video. Like watching videos gives me this sort of queasy feeling because it's my old television addiction. Mm. And, you know, my, my new addiction is like scrolling through text and reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we had a TV when I was a kid, like everybody, and um, my cousins didn't. My my aunt and uncle raised my cousins without one, and they were just I I I really admired that. I thought it was great for the for the kids that they were able to. Uh, their life wasn't focused in their home; it was focused out on what they were engaging with, and they were they're about ten years younger than me, so I I saw this. And I was sort of TV sick as a kid because I had my mom went back to work when my youngest brother went to kindergarten. And during the summers, it was the TV was your babysitter. Basically, you couldn't leave. We were both parents at work, three kids at home, not allowed to leave the house unless you're unless they were home. So, it, you know, we had this nothing to do but sit there and just scroll HBO and look at this garbage content and and I just, my, and then my brothers found video games. So it was just this very screen focused thing. And I, I hated that. I hate, I got to where I couldn't stand the sound of the television going and watching as my cousins went through this very different childhood. I thought that's what I want for my kids. I don't want my kids to grow up looking at a screen. And 
So I got rid of it when my daughters were young. And now I have a new husband and a TV came with him. So we have a TV, but we use it sparingly to watch movies as a family or something. So it's, you know, we're trying to integrate it in a graceful way. But I I think I could very easily live a whole life without that big box in the house. I would love to know what you think of four arguments for the elimination of television. I'll check it out. That's I'm intrigued. Yeah. So the thing is that we cannot tell the difference between real reality and manufactured reality on a screen, despite thinking that we can. I mean, there's one layer of our mind that can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And then there's all everything underneath that that cannot tell the difference. (laughs) So we are super manipulable by these moving images and sounds. And of course, now with the advent of AI, people are saying like, oh my gosh, we're so vulnerable. It's like, we've been vulnerable for decades. Mm -hmm. You're just, you know, it's just getting more and more extreme uh, or we can, we can be manipulated faster now, (laughs) but we've been vulnerable to this the whole time. Oh yeah. I totally believe it. Yeah. It's hard to, I, I've been on Twitter for, I guess, about a year and a half or so now. I'm, and it's it's interesting. It's sort of the conversations. I, I must be in echo chambers there because I see the, the way that the conversations loop around and you have these topics that come up and everybody's talking about the same thing for a while. And then it moves on to the next thing and the next thing. And even though I haven't been engaging with this for for that long proportionately to my life, it still sort of bleeds into where, where I don't know what's real life. I I kind of can confuse the the discourse there with something that's really meaningful. I want to over emphasize or over uh, you know overvalue the importance of that discourse over what's happening in real life, and I have to kind of check myself. And that's just a year and a half on this thing. So yeah, it, and then strange. real life. Everyone in real life is in their own echo chambers too. Mm -hmm. So we're, I don't know, we're having a a kind of mass crisis because we are, I guess we are, we are hiving. We are becoming more hive animals than we ever have been before. Mm -hmm. And we've just never done this before. I guess it'll work out experimental. Yeah, it'll work out some way. I read this book by A.O. Wilson about insects. He studied insects, Mm -hmm. but he says that uh, like bees and ants and humans are the only eusocial species, he calls them, species that form macroorganisms. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And bees and ants evolved from insect species that were not hive species. And there are some, I guess he talked about like some species that have like, they they jump from their individual mode to a hive mode, depending on how many of them there are. Hmm. And I just think humanity with the internet is uh, in this evolutionary transition phase where we are, we are, Dropping skills that uh, are helpful for us as individuals, and we are gaining skills that facilitate our being hive members. So all of this mobbing, I think, is part of it. That's really fascinating and disturbing. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Well, it's so great to speak with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you for an upcoming, another Solid Ground live stream. So we can do a part two on the conversation we started last time. That was fun. Yes, it was really fun to have you. We always have a good time on the, well, I shouldn't say always. Sometimes we talk about dark things, but we always manage to find something interesting. And it's, it's interesting when you leave the conversation open to where it can go, all the strange places it can go. I always find that I I feel really lucky to be able to have all these conversations. Me too. Um, 
What um what recommendations do you have or links do you want to say out loud for where people can find your work or follow what you're doing? Well, I hope you watch my movies. If you haven't, go to sitasingstheblues.com for one and sadermasochism.com for the other. In fact, Passover is coming up and sadermasochism is about Passover. But you should follow the links at sadermasochism.com to download it. Otherwise, you will see someone else's post of it on YouTube, which silences the music. So don't go to YouTube for that. Uh, go to my store, store.ninapaley.com. Go to apocalypseanimated.com. Go to my blog, ninapaley.com. But you'll see a lot of posts about Crohn's disease because I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease in December. And that has been most of what my life has been about until a couple of weeks ago, I'm finally responding to the medication. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. I heard you talk some about that. Yeah. Um, that must be really challenging, but I'm glad you're responding to the medication. Yeah. So am I. Food is great. It's <sighs> so great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy right now. Uh, and you know, that too will change because life goes in cycles, but mm -hmm. yeah, coming out of an illness and reading my old journals, hooray. Mm -hmm. Revisiting and moving through. Yeah. Well, it's been really great to speak with you. Thanks so much for having this conversation. Thank you so much, Leslie. Oh, also heterodorks.com, the heterodorks, heterodorks podcast spelled with yes. an X. Highly recommend. Awesome. Well, thanks, Nina. Thank you.